Amen. Today we're going to be looking at apologetics and why apologetics is really important. Some of you may have never heard of apologetics before. Some of you will be very, very familiar with it. Some of you overly familiar with it because you've done it so long with us. But it's important for the whole church to understand what apologetics is and why we use apologetics in sharing the gospel message. Because what we believe is vital. Um, many Christians have this amazing uh, scripture verse from the Bible that they love a lot. And this scripture verse is about, in the Old Testament, how the lion will lie down with the lamb. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Well, that verse doesn't actually exist. Lots of Christians love that scripture verse, talking about when the lion will lie down with the lamb, but study as hard as you might, it doesn't exist. It's nowhere in the Bible. And yet often you'll hear Christians mentioning that verse. What we believe is really, really important. And we've got to make sure that our beliefs are correct. When I was growing up, I used to believe in all kinds of things. There are children in the room, so I've got to be very careful what I say. But when I was young, I used to believe all kinds of things at Christmas. You know what I'm talking about. All kinds of things at Easter. All kinds of things my teeth fell out. And as I grew older, I began to realize that perhaps those beliefs weren't entirely accurate. And we're living in a society today that demands evidence, that demands proof. We're not living in a world that will just believe any old thing for the sake of believing it. We're not living in a society that will just latch on to a religion or to a belief system just because we tell them to. We have to give people today good reasons to believe. People today are not as ignorant as they were in the past. In the past, really, the only highly educated people were the people who went through school and got a really good education and went on to university and studied in the libraries and had all these books. Nowadays, we've got AI telling us everything we want to know. If you want an answer to any question, you go onto Google, you go onto YouTube, you watch a short, and you get that answer instantly. And so today, people have information at their fingertips. And we cannot just tell people to believe in God or believe in Jesus without backing that up with very strong reasons as to why they should. After all, why should they believe in the God of the Holy Bible? Why should they believe in Yahweh? And it's our job as Christians to give reasons for the hope that we have according to the Apostle Peter. And that's what I really love about the Christian faith. It's not a blind belief system. The God we serve emphasizes over and over and over again, look at the evidence and believe. Even when Moses went into Egypt, he didn't go into Egypt empty handed. God said, I'm going with you. Put your hand into your cloak, pull it out. It'll be leprous. Boom. So it was. Show this to Pharaoh. Cast your, snake, uh, cast your staff down onto the floor. It will turn into a snake. He did it in front of Pharaoh. There we go. There's the evidence. And over and over again, whenever God reveals himself, to the people of this world, he does so through means of evidence, through means of apologetics. And so what is apologetics? It is the defense of the Christian faith. We're going to look at that in just a bit more in a moment, but it comes from the Greek word apologia. Let's move on to the next screen. Okay, so apologetics is a field of study concerning uh, the rational defense and justification for the Christian faith. It comes from the word apologia, which means defense, defense. We defend the faith. It doesn't mean we apologize for the faith, like we're saying sorry for Jesus or whatever. You know? It means we are defending the faith. We are going to war to defend what we believe. Because how many of you know there are plenty of people out there that want to tear down Christianity? Many, many uh, vocal atheists who want to bring Christianity and all world faiths to an end. And if the church doesn't speak up, that's what will happen because they've got a louder voice. So we need to start fighting back. We need to start defending the faith and giving rational and logical reasons why belief in God and belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ is absolutely um, certain and paramount for our salvation. And so our goal is to offer logical arguments and evidence to support these religious beliefs and doctrines when challenged or questioned. Uh, we seek to do this through arguments from history, philosophy, science, archaeology, mathematics, and other fields of study to build a cumulative case for the Christian faith. 
and we address issues such as the existence of God, reliability of scripture, divinity of Jesus, resurrection, problem of evil and suffering and alleged contradictions in the scriptures. Because all over YouTube at the moment, I'm sure if you're on YouTube, you'll see lots of atheists on there attacking Christianity, saying that the Bible is immoral, the God of the Bible is immoral, he condones slavery and all these sorts of things. And they're constantly trying to wear down and undermine the Christian faith and the Holy Scriptures. They are using scriptures out of context. They're not uh, sharing them properly. But once again, the majority of the church is silent. And so the world is not listening to a balanced, reasonable uh, discussion. They are just listening to what the atheists have to say. Because the atheists often seem more passionate about their atheism than Christians do about Jesus. And that's very, very wrong. And it's, it's odd that in the world today, the people who really have the truth are the quietest people on earth. Yet the people with all the errors and the lies and the misinformation, they have got a platform like you wouldn't believe. And they are pushing this agenda of lies and people are listening. So it's our responsibility as the church, as a whole, to speak up. Just imagine if the entire church, Anglicans, Baptists, Pentecostals, Charismatics, Evangelicals in this country stood up with one voice and declared the truth and the evidence for the existence of God and the resurrection of Jesus. Can you imagine how powerful that would be? That wouldn't just shake the UK, that would shake the world. So why are we so silent? Why are we so afraid? What are we afraid of? I don't know. Let's move on to the next screen. Okay, so many, many examples of apologetics in the Holy Bible. For any of you in here who are concerned, hang on a minute, this isn't biblical. Uh, yeah, it is. The entire Bible is an apologetical book. Okay, if you study the ministry of Jesus and you study the ministries of the apostles and the early Christians, you will see they were all apologists, every single one of them. Jesus continually offered evidences to the people of Israel. Those evidences came in the form of healings, resurrections, driving out demonic spirits, the use of argumentation, the use of Old Testament messianic prophecy as evidence. Over and over and over again, Jesus would give evidence after evidence after evidence as to who he was to the point where he said even if you don't believe the words i'm speaking to you believe on the signs because these are evidence i've been sent from the father mm -hmm. so jesus never expected people even in his generation who already believed in god he never expected them just to believe he was the messiah he expected them to believe based upon the wealth of evidence and proofs he had given to them. And that is the society we're living in today. They demand evidence. They demand proof. So think of yourself no longer as just a Christian. Think of yourself now as a very clever, sophisticated lawyer or solicitor. Somebody who has to present the case for Christianity. And you have to present it in a persuasive and logical fashion if you want to see people turn to Jesus Christ. Also, never believe for a moment that you have to somehow prove the existence of God to people. Remember what the book of Romans says. They already have the knowledge of God deep down on the inside of them. So we're not trying to prove the existence of God necessarily to people. What we are trying to do, though, is to tear down the strongholds in their mind that they've set up. When Adam and Eve sinned against the holy God, what did they immediately do? They hid. When the Israelites came out of Egypt with the mighty signs and wonders and powers of God, after overthrowing the kingdom of Pharaoh, they crossed through the Red Sea. What were the people of Canaan doing? What were the people of Jericho doing? They were hiding behind fortresses, walls, strongholds. Even when the spies went in and they stayed with Rahab, what did Rahab say? We've heard about your God. We know what he's coming here to do. The people of Jericho were not ignorant of God. They were just trying to hide from him. And it's the same in society today. Every human being, atheist or not, deep down has a knowledge of Almighty God. They already believe. 
but they have put up these walls, these strongholds in their mind. They've hardened their heart. And so it's the job of the apologist not to try and convince someone that God exists. They already believe. They really do. I can remember when I was an atheist, I still kind of knew deep down. And I'm sure you can all agree with that. So the job of the apologist, the job of the Christian is to go on in and tear down these arguments that have set themselves up against the knowledge of God, to tear down the opposing arguments so that the walls of Jericho in their mind and in their heart collapse and we can rush on in with the spear and the sword of the gospel message. That's the purpose of apologetics. Jesus used it. The apostles used it. The early church used it. And you've ever wondered why Christianity was, you know, it started as such this, this tiny little thing in Jerusalem. How did it very, very rapidly take over the entire Roman Empire? It took over the world. How did it do that? It's because those early Christians used apologetics. They proved their faith. Whereas the pagan uh, uh, people who followed the pagan deities and the pagan faith, they couldn't prove what they were saying. But Christianity could be proven. They could literally point to the empty tomb. They could perform signs and wonders and miracles and confirm the message by which they spoke. And for those of you who have been coming along on a Tuesday evening and studying the book of Acts, you will see that page after page after page of the book of Acts is nothing more than the apostles performing signs, wonders, miracles, and using prophecy from the Old Testament, proving and confirming and debating that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior. And today, God uses no lesser means. The means by which he has adopted and given to his church is the means of apologetics. And it's through this God's grace is released so that people can then receive the gospel and be saved. And it's no coincidence in the world today that the churches that are growing the most with true converts and true believers are those churches who have adopted the biblical method of apologetics. So let's have a look at some scriptures. And what I've done in these scriptures, instead of using the English word that's translated as defense... I've used the original Greek word, apologia, so you can see just how many times it's in the Bible. These are just a few examples. Acts 22 verse 1, Paul is speaking. Brothers and fathers, hear the apologia or the apologetics that I now make before you. Acts 25 16. I answered them that it's not customary for the Romans to give up anyone before the accused meets the accusers face to face and had opportunity to make his apologia concerning the charge laid against him. 1 Corinthians 9 3. This is my apologia to those who would examine me, Philippians 1, 7. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the apologia or apologia and confirmation of the gospel. Philippians 1, 16. The latter do so out of love, knowing um, that I am put here for the apologia of the gospel. Can you see how the word apologia or apologetics is always linked with the gospel? Over and over again, this is what the apostles do. 1 Peter 3.15, this is a command to us from the Lord, but in your hearts honour Christ as Lord, as holy, always being prepared to make an apologia to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that's in you, yet do this with gentleness and respect. And 2 Timothy 4.16, at my first apologia, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. So very clearly through New Testament scriptures, uh, apologetics or apologias are used over and over and over again by those early Christians in relation to presenting the gospel message. And this is God's method, by the way, guys. And we've got to be very, very careful that we don't follow modern means and modern methodologies to try and present the gospel. Because these modern means and these modern methodologies have not been created by God. They've been cooked up by marketers and advertisers. And we can go into the history of where this came from afterwards, if you like. But the modern day approach of sharing the gospel message is not biblical for the most part. But if we want to be a biblical church that follows biblical methodology, we have to return to the scriptures and do it the way Jesus did it and the way that his apostles and early disciples did it. And the church continued in this tradition with uh, people like Justin Martyr. You might have heard of Justin Martyr or uh, St. Augustine. These men continued the same tradition of the apostles in presenting uh, apologetical cases. 
Some of you have heard of more recent apologists like C.S. Lewis, a very, very powerful soul winner. Uh, you may have heard of somebody like Josh McDowell, evidence that demands a verdict. And in recent times, of course, there's people like John Lennox and uh, Dr. William Lane Craig. These men are leading multitudes of people to Jesus Christ through the use of apologetics plus the gospel message. It's never either or, it's both together at the same time. Let's move on to the next screen. But are there good reasons to think that God exists? And the answer to that question is? Yes. Yeah, there's loads. There's tons of good reasons. In fact, there are 20, I would say, airtight, very, very, very strong evidences or arguments for the existence of God and the resurrection of Jesus. Around about 20 that we can learn as individuals. Uh, but there's a, a shed load of evidence to confirm that the God of the Holy Bible is true, that Jesus of Nazareth really did rise from the dead on the third day. And as we present these evidences before people and tear down the strongholds that they put up in their minds, they are far more then open and susceptible to hearing the gospel message and believing. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. Let's have a look at just a very simple argument we can all learn very, very quickly. After this, uh, this is Professor James Tor, who's one of the most renowned scientists in the world today. He's one of the top 10 chemists in the world. And I uh, just want to say, before we move on to the next screen, that science in no way is opposed to Christianity or opposed to God. You'll often hear atheists say this, but these atheists are lying to you, okay? It is an out and out, flat and outright lie. In no way does science oppose the Bible. In no way does science oppose God. A science confirms the Bible. Science confirms creation. Science confirms God. And there's a difference between scientific theories that don't have much substance to them and much evidence. You can kind of put those to one side. And those scientific theories that have a wealth of evidence. And we don't all camp or group them into one camp. Okay, there are like hundreds of scientific theories some are really, really, really good with loads of evidence. Some are just ideas. And sometimes Christians get confused by saying, well, it's just a theory. Well, well, hold on. It's not just a theory. Some theories are really, really good. Some theories are naff. And so as Christians, don't just kind of like throw the baby out with the bathwater. Some scientific theories have a wealth of evidence supporting them. And the ones that do, guess what? They confirm the Bible. The naff ones don't. And so we never have to fear science. Science is just a tool by which we discover how God created the universe and how the universe works. It's like somebody looking underneath the, the hood or the bonnet of a car, seeing the combustion engine and saying, aha, I've now discovered the combustion engine and I now know how it works. Therefore, there is no Henry Ford. It's absolute nonsense, right? It's a stupid argument, but that's what atheists do. We now know how the cell works. We now know how DNA works. We know that the universe came by a big bang. Therefore, there is no God. What? It's the same thing. Just because we're working out how God does things doesn't mean there's no God. If we can work out how God does stuff, then there is a God. If there's a combustion engine in a Ford, then there's a Henry Ford that kind of started the whole manufacturing process off of Ford, right? Okay, same argument. And he says, I build molecules for a living. I can't begin to tell you how difficult that job is. I stand in awe of God because of what he has done through creation. Only a rookie, a novice, who knows nothing about science, would say that science takes away from faith. If you really study science, it will bring you closer to God. And this guy is at cutting edge. I mean, he builds molecular cars for a living. These vehicles, they've got little wheels on them and everything. These vehicles, you can't even see with the naked eye. They are so small, they're made of these molecules that he puts together, and then they put medicine into these molecular cars, and then they drive up and down your veins. And they get to the point that's sick, and these molecular vehicles dump the medicine and then they drive off again. That's what he builds for a living. He is just a genius intellect and he loves Jesus more than anything. And he says, science will always bring you closer to God because as you study science, you are just in awe 
of how awesome our creator God is. Let's go to the next screen. This is the one I was talking about. Most of us have a mobile phone. If you've got one, hold it in the air and wave it like you're proud. If you just don't care. Brilliant, okay. Well, no, I'm gonna get you all put the lights on and just do that as we're, as we're worshiping. That'd be awesome, right? Um, so this is a mobile phone and you can use your mobile phone as a tool, thank you, Dan, as a tool to share your faith. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, it's really, really easy. You just simply ask your uh, unbelieving friend now, they might be an atheist, they might be an agnostic, it doesn't really matter. You can just say to them, hey, where do you think this phone came from? Some sort of apple. How did you get that? Um, ask them, where do you think this phone came from? And give them one of three choices, because really they only have one of three choices, right? Did something design and create this phone? Did this phone design and create itself? Or did nothing create this phone? You've only got one of those three options. All right. Did someone design and create this? Did it design and create itself? Did nothing design and create this phone? Let's have a look at the first question. Did nothing create this phone? What's the problem with that? From nothing, nothing comes because nothing doesn't exist. It's no thing, literally no thing and nothing doesn't have any properties at all. So it has no powers, no potentials, no possibilities. And if there's no potential for a phone to arise, it won't arise. If there's no possibility of a phone arising, it won't arise. And if there's no power to bring about a phone, it won't arise. So we know as an absolute matter of fact, nothing did not create your mobile phone. And so you can just bravely and boldly say that to your friend. Do you really believe nothing created this phone? They say, of course not, of course not. Well, let's look at the second question. Maybe the phone created itself. What's the problem with this? It would have to exist to create itself before it existed. Yes, awesome. The phone would need to exist before it existed in order to bring itself into existence. How many of you can see the logical absurdity with that? Don't make sense, right? It's like you giving birth to you. Not a copy of you, but you literally giving birth to who you are right now. How could you possibly do that? Especially if you're a man. How could you possibly bring yourself into being? You'd have to go back in time to bring you. It doesn't work. It's craziness. So we know that nothing didn't create the phone. The phone certainly did not create itself. Therefore, what option are you left with? Someone designed it and manufactured it and created it, right? And how many of you know that's like the, the logical option? Makes sense, right? There isn't any other option. If a phone exists, then someone designed it and someone created it. Let's go to the next screen. What about the universe then? The planets, the stars, all of space, time, matter and energy planet Earth, the moon. Where did the whole universe come from? We know the universe has not been here forever. If it had, all of the stars would have burned out by now. They'd have all gone dark. The fact there are still stars burning shows the usable energy in the universe has not been used up yet, which means the universe is only finitely old. It's not infinite, okay, in the past. It had an absolute beginning not so long ago. So, did nothing create the universe? No. What's the problem with that? No. Nothing can't create anything. It's got no properties, potentials or powers. Did the universe create itself maybe? No, why? Why could the universe not create itself? Because it would have to exist before it existed in order to bring itself into existence. So we know as a matter of fact, nothing did not create the universe. We also know as a matter of fact, that the universe did not create itself, which leaves us with only one option, and that is? Something, well, we'll get to that in a second. Something designed it and created it. Donna, you're awesome. Okay, let's go to the next screen. Go back. Okay, so we can kind of sum this up into an argument called the cosmological argument. And if premise number one is true, and premise number two is true, and they both hold, 
then the conclusion naturally follows. And we can use this when talking to our friends, and we do it all the time. And this is one of the best ways of leading somebody to Christ. So the cosmological argument, you can take photographs of it if you like, I encourage you to do so. Premise one is whatever begins to exist has a cause. Never miss out that word begins because of course God did not begin and God does not have a cause. But whatever begins to exist has a cause. You began to exist some time ago. And why did you begin to exist? Because your parents got together one night. That's why you began to exist. And the reason your parents began to exist is because your grandparents got together one night and so on and so forth. Whatever begins to exist has a cause prior to its existence. It's that cause and effect, chicken and egg, right? Same as this phone, it didn't used to exist, it now does because everything that begins to exist has a cause. Premise number two, the universe began to exist. Science has confirmed this, mathematics has confirmed this, and philosophy always knew this, well, to a degree. So, if the universe began to exist, and premise one, whatever begins to exist, has a cause, the conclusion logically and naturally follows, therefore the universe has a cause. Everyone agree with that? Yeah. Good, let's move on to the next screen. Let's have a look at what the cause of the universe could be. Well, if the cause of the universe caused the universe, it must exist prior to the universe. Therefore, it's not part of the universe, it exists outside of the universe. If it exists outside of the universe, then it is the creator of the universe and not the universe itself. Second, when the universe came into being, space, time and matter came into being. In fact, the very opening verse of the uh, the book of Genesis says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Hebrew, it's uh, Bereshit, which means in the beginning or, or, or when time began. Uh, Elohim, God, created uh, Hashamim, the heavens, that's space, and Hava Haaretz, which is matter or substance, the earth. And so right off the bat, the Holy Bible gets this right. There was a beginning of, uh, of time. And at the very beginning of time, God created space and he created matter. That's what the Big Bang now suggests. And the Bible predicted the Big Bang three and a half thousand years before scientists discovered it. Now, if space and time and matter came into existence at the moment of creation, or what scientists call the Big Bang, then prior to the universe existing, there was no space, there was no time, there was no matter. Therefore, the cause of the universe must be spaceless or omnipresent. It must also be timeless or eternal. It must also be immaterial or what we would call spirit or what we would call mind or consciousness. Okay? It must also be really powerful to bring all of that energy into existence. <coughs> It also has to have the ability to create, therefore it's a creator, and it must also have a desire to do so, otherwise the universe would never have begun. So when we look at these logical facts that most people can just work out if they think about it long enough, we come to the conclusion that the cause of the universe is transcendent, spaceless, timeless, immaterial, really powerful with the ability to create and the desire to do so. And who does that sound like to you? God. Brilliant. And that's one very simple argument you can learn in an afternoon. It will take you no longer than an hour or two to memorize this. And then you go to work on your friends and family practicing it. And at first you might fluff it up and get it a little bit wrong here and there. That's fine. We, I did too when I started. But after a while you just get into the flow, into the swing of it. And then you will leave your friends and family and atheists and agnostic absolutely stumped like, yeah, logic drives us to the conclusion that God must exist. And not just any God, but the God who created space, time and matter, which is the very opening verse of the book of Genesis. I mean, how awesome is God? He doesn't just put it anywhere in the Bible. It's like, boom, right opening verse. Boom, here you go, here's the evidence for me. The very opening verse of the whole Holy Bible, God gives it to us. And then it says, right, now, believe in me. 
okay? And all the way through the Bible, you go through the Old Testament and you go through the New Testament and uh, over and over again, it keeps saying the same thing. There was a beginning to time. There was a beginning to space. There was a beginning to matter and energy and all things came into being through the word of his power. Everything was created by Jesus Christ and for Christ. Christ was crucified before time began. Over and over again, the Bible emphasizes over and over space, time and matter had an absolute beginning and God brought the universe into being. There is so much evidence for the Christian faith. No other faith system in the world believes this Amen. only judaism and christianity get it right 100 percent of the time that's why you can trust it it's so exciting i'm so glad that i have a faith in god that's not just based on some emotional feeling because of a hillsong song i've just heard now, i'm not against their music but listen emotionalism is good to a degree but when the rubber hits the road, when something hits the fan and your emotionalism goes and you lose your faith. I just lost my job. I don't believe in God anymore. Someone I love just died. I don't believe in God anymore. Because your faith was rooted not in the mind, but in the heart. And the heart is deceptive above all things. And when you're feeling good, your faith is high. When you're feeling rubbish, your faith is low and almost non-existent. That's not how we were called to live. God never once said, just have an emotional belief in me. That's how you shipwreck yourself. We must have an emotional faith and an intellectual one. That's why God said, love me with all of your heart and with all of your And when we obey God, we have this strong faith, this faith that when our emotions are low, we're like, no, nah, God still exists. The logic still stands. God is there, whether I feel him or not. He feels like a million miles away. Well, he's not. He's promised never to leave you or forsake you. And he indwells you. But you know how you feel sometimes? And we all feel that, pastors included. God, where are you? Why have thou forsaken me? It's like, what are you talking about, your Wally? I'm right here. I don't feel it. Forget about your feelings. Love me with your mind. All right, then. Let's keep going. Let's keep doing this, Lord. Okay, let's move on to the next screen. Right, so how do we share the faith then? Number one, present a logical case for Christianity. This is apologetics. Number two, reveal a person standing before God. Number three, offer hope. So if we're going to share our faith effectively in the world today, we must convince, convict, and convert. Everyone say it with me. Convince, convict, convert. And again, convince, convict, convert. This is how Jesus did it. How did Jesus do it? Jesus went around performing signs and wonders and miracles, healing the sick, driving out demons, raising the dead, offering messianic prophecies as proof, right? Jesus was the embodiment of the word of God. He offered evidence wherever he went. And then people would start coming to him. We believe you're the Messiah. The rich young ruler came to him, right? You know, I believe you're the Messiah. Lord, I'll do, I'll do anything to follow you. I've kept all the commandments since my youth. And Jesus looked at him and Jesus loved him and said, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have and then come and follow me. What is Jesus doing that for? A bit mean, isn't it? Just imagine if he said that to us. Go and sell your home, go and sell your car, go and sell your clothes, give away all your money, all the food in your fridge, get rid of the lot and come and follow me. How many of you would be like, yeah? How many would be like, oh no, I love my car, I love my TV, I love my PlayStation. Why did Jesus do this to this young guy at this point? Let me tell you. He already believed he was the Messiah. He had heard and seen the signs, wonders, and miracles. He had had the evidence. He had already been convinced. But before anyone can be saved, they must be convicted of their sin. And this young man was self-righteous. I have kept the law of God since my youth. Look how good I am. Lord, if anyone is deserving of heaven, I'm your man. What's got two thumbs and is self-righteous? This guy. 
And that's how he was. He's like, Lord, you know, I, 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 I'm brilliant. Just, just accept me. And Jesus said, right, you believe you've kept all of the commandments. Yes, Lord, go and sell everything you've got. Because this young guy didn't realize, but he was breaking the law with idolatry. He loved his money more than he loved Jesus. And Jesus knew that. So Jesus brought this guy under conviction by using the law of God. That's the purpose of the law, by the way. The law was never given to make anyone righteous. The law was given so that sin would increase. So that as sin increases, so <laughs> grace increases, which would bring about the coming of Jesus to save us. The law was never given to make anyone righteous. The Bible says if you keep the whole law and stumble at just one point, you are guilty of breaking the whole law. The whole covenant is based on you keeping 613 commandments perfectly, without error. You break one of the 613, you're guilty of breaking the entire covenant between Israel and God. That's how it was viewed. Wow, pressure. Let's move on to the next screen. Let's look now at convict. We've already looked at convince. So we must reveal a person standing before God if they're ever to be saved. Romans 7, 7, Paul writes, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Romans 3.20, therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Psalm 19 verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? It converts the soul. The Hebrew word there is shub. It means to turn back, to repent. Um, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making the wise simple. So what's the purpose of the law? To bring a knowledge of sin, to convert the soul. The purpose of the law was never to make anyone righteous. It was to highlight how sinful and wicked we really are. And Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers said this, they will never accept grace until they tremble before a just and holy law. Today up and down the land, the church in many places has forsaken the methodology given by God and Jesus. And it's used marketing techniques instead. Or it's appealed to human desires. Do you want to be healthy? Wealthy? Prosperous? Come to Jesus and he will make you this way. That's a satanic lie. That's a false gospel from the devil. Do you want Jesus to sort out your relational problems, your finances? Come to Jesus. Come to him. He will sort out your bank balance. He will sort out your marriage. That's a satanic lie. There is no promise he will do that for you. If you want to sort out your bank balance, go to work, work hard, earn a living. And if you're not getting paid what you think you're worth, go and get a job where you are earning what you think you're worth. And instead of spending it, save it. Jesus isn't going to bring money to you just because you're, you don't want to go out and work. You just want to sit there and pray. Lord, make me rich. I wish. Jesus nowhere promises that. Jesus himself didn't have anywhere to lay his head. He didn't have posh palaces and houses to live in. He said, I ain't got nowhere to lay my head. And Jesus doesn't promise you to live healthy every single day. Paul didn't. Elisha didn't. Many of the men and the women of God in the Bible were sick on a regular basis. There is no promise of walking in divine health. That's another lie from the devil. Now, can healings occur? Yes, but they're signs. They're not a divine right. And when Isaiah says that by his stripes you are healed, he is not talking about sicknesses. He is talking about Israel's rebellion and sin. Read the context. God will heal Israel of her rebellious sin by the stripes of the Messiah. Even Peter, in 2 Peter, I believe it is, uses this scripture, 
It's one of the few places in the New Testament in regards to Israel's sin and how Jesus will heal Israel and Israel will come back to him. Or that modern message, do you feel lonely? Come to Jesus. You've got a God-shaped hole in your heart. Come to Jesus. These are all lies. None of these gospels will ever save anyone. They might grow a congregation with people because the people who are coming along find friendships, free coffee and cake, nice music, a nice moral family they can raise their kids in. And they love the atmosphere and the environment, but they've never been converted or born again or saved or spirit filled. And that's one of the reasons why the church in this country, in one respect, is so large, but on another respect, so ineffective and quiet because they don't have the spirit of God. It's like the Laodicean church, a church that met together, sung the songs, listened to the sermons. They got together day after day, week after week. But what did Jesus say? You are blind. You are pitiful. You are naked. Purchase from me white robes of salvation. I stand at the door. I knock. I want to come in. And the door is not the door of a building. They didn't have church buildings. The door is the door of their hearts. Jesus was on the outside of them. He wasn't living in them. They were a visible church that did all of the, the Christian things, but they were not saved. They were lukewarm, Laodicean. And the only way you can come to Christ is by means of the biblical method of being convinced, convicted, and then coming to God on the basis of trembling under conviction and the holy law. Now hear an amen to that. Amen. Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world in regards to three things. In regards to sin, in regards to righteousness, and in regards to the coming judgment. And if as Christians we preach a message that erases sin and erases righteousness and erases the coming judgment, then what can the Holy Spirit convict people of? Nothing. And if they're not convicted, they can't repent. And without repentance, there is no salvation. The only way people can get saved is if they come under the conviction of their own sin. And the only way they'll see their own sin is through the use of the law. Does that make sense? Yes. Let's look at the next screen. So what can we say? I would never go up to somebody and say, you're a sinner. Repent. The end is nigh. I'd never say that. I'd never judge somebody or condemn somebody. I'm not here to condemn or to judge. I'm here to convict with the grace of the Holy Spirit upon me. So I will use the law of God to do this. And I'll simply ask them questions. Have you ever told a lie? And everyone will say, yeah. yes. What do you call people who tell a lie? Liars. Liars. Have you ever stolen something? Yes. Most people will say yes. And if they say no, say, I don't believe you. You've already told me you're a Okay. Have you stolen something? Yes. What do you call people who steal things? Thief. A stealer, no a thief. <laughs> okay. Have you ever misused God's name by saying O-M-G? Yes. J-C. Most people say yes. I've even heard Christians doing this. Pack it in. Holy name. Yes, I've done that. Yeah. What do you call people who misuse God's name? Begins with B. Blasphemer. Okay, have you ever, looked, so it's, this gets everyone this one. Have you ever looked with someone at lust? Oh yeah, everyone does that, of course I do. Mm. Jesus said, if you look with lust upon someone or upon a woman, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. So when Jesus is, is looking at this stuff, he's not saying, hey, have you done, have you literally committed adultery? He's saying, even if you've done it in your mind, even if you've done it in your heart, you have sin within you and you're already breaking my law. And the greatest of all commandments is, have you put God first place in your life? And who can honestly say they've ever done that? And I stand before you today as guilty of every single one of them. Okay? Guilty of all of those. I'm sure everybody in this room is, unless you're a little, little child, everyone is guilty of those, of those things. And so you can then turn around to your friend and say, well, by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, blaspheming, adulterer who has not put God first. When you stand before him on the day of judgment and he judges you according to his law, are you going to be innocent or guilty? And what are they all going to say? Guilty. guilty. 
Heaven or hell? hell? Well, I hope I go to heaven. Well, God is just. God is good. God is holy. He can't not let anyone into heaven. He can't turn a blind eye to sin. If God turned a blind eye to crimes and to sin, he would be unjust, unholy. For God to be holy, he must punish every act of disobedience. That's why the Bible says the wages of sin are? But the gift of God is? eternal life so once somebody realizes that they're a sinner headed for the day of judgment and they're going to end up in hell for eternity at that point and only at that point can you begin to share hope if you share hope before they recognize they're a sinner it will be cheap grace to them and you might get them to come along to church for a couple of weeks and then they'll drift back off to the nightclubs and the pubs and the sex and everything else because they've never truly received the Spirit of God and it's just religion to them. This is the method Jesus used. This is the method the apostles used. This is the method used by people like Finney and Wisley and Whit Whitfield and um, Spurgeon and Moody and Billy Graham. They all used this biblical methodology, and that's why God used them so powerfully in their day and age. And if you want to be used powerfully, use God's methodology. For the one who wins souls is wise. The Bible doesn't say the one who wins souls is handsome or good looking. The one who wins souls is eloquent. The one who wins souls is a real people person. The Bible doesn't say that. The one who wins souls is wise. They're clever. They've thought this through. They've learned the methodology. And they obey God rather than trying to do it their own way. If you are wise, you will shine as lights in this world. And you will lead multitudes to repentance and salvation. Let's go to the next screen. I'm going to finish very soon. Number three, convert. Once they tremble under the holy law, now you offer hope. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first for the jew then to the gentile so salvation is by belief and not just vague belief but a true pistis a true faith or trust in what christ has done let's go to the next screen just as moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness so the son of man jesus must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Ephesians 2, 8-9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And Romans 10 verses 9 to 10, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth you profess your faith and are saved. Salvation from start to finish is always by faith, pistis, belief, trust. Gary Habermas, the great theologian and historian on the resurrection of Jesus said, it's like saying, I do, to your husband or wife at the altar. I do. I commit myself to you. I trust in you. I believe in you. I'm going to devote my life to you. It is that belief, that committance of your life to that other person that saves you. And so today, everyone in this place is guilty of breaking God's law, myself included. And if we were to die today and stand before him, if we do not follow and trust in Jesus, we would not go to heaven. We would go to hell for eternity. So I want to make sure that every single person in this room has had that opportunity to make Jesus Christ their Lord, their King, their Savior. Do you know that you know that you know that if you die today, you'd go to heaven? I'm going to give you that opportunity right now to make Jesus Christ your Lord. Everybody close your eyes, bow your heads. If you want to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior right now, have your sins forgiven because what he did for you upon the cross, raise your hand up in the air. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.
God bless you. Anybody else? Four people so far? Five people at the back. God bless you. God, pop your hands down. God bless you. God bless you.